Okay, guys, guys let's, let's start. So, today we're going to talk about async AO uh, today and what might happen to tomorrow. My name is Yuri, Yuri Selivanov. I've been a core developer for about five years, and during these five years, I've been lucky enough to work on some, some pretty interesting stuff in, uh, in Python that's, that includes uh, the async await syntax, asynchronous generators, asynchronous comprehensions lately, context variables. Um, I'm the lead maintainer of async IO. Um, created UV loop library a while ago, which is an alternative event loop implementation for async IO. Uh, like it's used well, pretty, pretty wildly now. A lot of a lot of big companies use, use it in production. I co-created the async PG library with Elvis, who is also here today. Uh, that's an asynchronous Postgres uh, PostgreSQL driver. And I work on HDB, which is an object relational database. It's a new thing. Uh, I unfortunately I won't be able to talk about it just during this uh, this talk. But if you have any questions after the talk, I'll be happy to answer them. And you, of course, you can follow me on Twitter and GitHub. My nickname there is uh, one st one. So um, before we get to the meat of the talk, let's uh, let's briefly discuss how async was born. It's, it's history because it explains some of the idiosyncr idiosyncrasies that it has in its design. So uh, Guido started to work on async, uh, async I/O around Python 3.3. We just landed yield from syntax, and partly we actually landed it for uh, for something like async I/O. So Guido was working on async uh, on some asynchronous stuff back when he was working in Google, and uh, back then we actually had two different approaches to um, uh, to asynchronous and concurrent code in Python. That was Greenlets and Stackless Python, uh, and uh, the, those frameworks still exist. That's, that's Gvent, the Ventlet, um, and also libraries like Twisted and Tornado, um, which were pretty popular more, uh, b b b back these days. Um, and they also influenced async IO pretty, in a in pretty, pretty significant time, uh, pretty significant way. For instance, transports and protocols and callbacks, they, they kind of all came from Twisted. But it was obvious that we don't really want to move, uh, don't really want to choose the g band way uh, of doing things. We want, we want, we want the things to be explicit. So uh, in Python 3.4, uh, async IO uh, lands to, to Python and become, becomes part of um, uh, part of the standard library. It was smart provisional, and what, what, what that meant is that we could actually uh, push new features and new uh, things to async IO in bug fix releases, new APIs. We could even break things, but we uh, didn't really do that. Um, async IO was focused on uh, mostly low level APIs, so we recreated a lot of stuff from Twisted. We had protocols, we had transports. Futures, which are basically deferred, twisted deferred objects with some modifications. And uh, it also had uh, core routines via the uh, yield from syntax, and it was all, also a novel idea back then. Um, of course, it had some high level APIs, uh, like streams and sub processes that were supposed to work with uh, yield from core routines, but because the that that was kind of a new thing. I, uh, some some of those APIs uh, weren't weren't perfect. In Python 3.5, we got the async await syntax, uh, and that was, I guess, the first public acknowledgement that asynchronous programming can be a first-class feature in Python. Uh, async await was still provisional, so we were uh, trying to evolve it, and even in bug fixes, bug fix releases. Um, it, it received a bunch of new APIs, but nothing, nothing significant, nothing that stands out. Uh, back then I created UV loop, and that was also pretty interesting because it was an example of a first example of a library that kind of allowed you to swap the, uh, the standard event loop with, uh, with uh, third party event loop implementation completely and everything just continued to work magically. And back then also David Beasley created Curio, which was a pretty interesting moment because he, he decided that we don't really need transport, we, transports, we don't really need protocols and callbacks and that you can basically write programs just with async await without all that all that craft. And uh, at first the idea kind of seemed uh, ridiculous to a lot of us, but then 
uh, we uh, we realize that yes, he is right. It's actually perfectly reasonable and perfectly possible to write programs with async await. And what's more important is that those programs are easier to read and easier to maintain. So we're looking at Curie and thinking what kind of features we can we can actually steal from it, kind kind of port to async IO, uh, why people uh, like Curie so much. Uh, so both me, Guido, and uh, uh, other core, core developers were kind of paying attention. So in Python 3.6, async has stopped being provisional. That, that means that uh, the evolution uh, cycle for it got longer. We had to wait for a major release. Uh, we got asynchronous generators and asynchronous comprehensions landed in Python. And uh, we also fixed get event loop function. And that, that basically thanks to Curio because uh, before before Python 3.6, get event loop was really, really weird. Uh, it could return a new event loop, a random uh, event loop. Uh, it was basically completely unpredictable. It all depended on the current policy, and uh, even the default policy in async had some weird bugs in it. So you couldn't really use this, this function to, to get the currently running event loop reliably. And that, uh, that in part, kind of created this pattern in async IO that you had to care about the event loop. You have to use it. Even, even when you use the async await, you kind of always pass around the, the event loop to all libraries like AIHTTP. So once we fixed the, uh, the, this function and we fixed it in, in, uh, in such a way that it always returned the currently running event loop if you call this function from a coroutine, because when you call it from a coroutine, there is only one event loop that currently runs this coroutine. Uh, so it's pretty pretty well determined. Uh, once we fixed it, we kind of started to tell people, uh, well, don't actually pass event loop around in async await applications. Just just you just don't need that. Uh, just just use this function and because all other libraries and APIs use that function anyways. It all kind of just just started to work as expected correctly. We added a bunch of uh, low-level APIs to async IO, of course, uh, in the in 36, but again, nothing significant. And um, there was another interesting point um, back then. Nathaniel Smith created this library. It's called Trio. And just like Curio, it was developed basically from scratch. Uh, it's also only async uh, and await library. It doesn't have any callbacks or protocols. Uh, but Nathaniel kind of focused more on usability, on uh, predictability of your async await code. And uh, we'll actually talk about Trio a little bit later. And Python 3.7, which is basically a couple of months old now, uh, the uh, headline feature for async IO is context virus, and we'll also cover it a little bit later. We also converted async IO's own code to async await. So if you look at uh, async IO source code in Python 3.7, you will see that it uses async await, and it's slightly more readable and modern. Uh, and we finally landed the async IO run function. And uh, again, I first thought about that function when I, when I saw Curio and wanted to actually land this function in 3.6, uh, but didn't have time to properly do that before the free, feature freeze uh, period. And um, there are a few other interesting APIs that we added in 3.7, actually a lot of them. Uh, just to highlight, highlight a few, we now have a send file, so you can, uh, you can um, uh, send files in, in an optimized way using the OS send file. Um, system call uh, on pretty much any transport in async IO. You can upgrade transports uh, from an unencrypted um, connection to a TLS connection. A uh, few high level and uh, top level functions like create task and get running loop and buffered protocol, which is a super low level API, but essentially some protocols that involve a lot of uh, copying or just basically pass through the data. Uh, with buffered protocol, you have a very tight control over buffers. And you're gonna you can avoid extra copies, and that can lead to some pretty significant performance improvements. So now let's talk about async await in, in, in modern async IO. And, uh, a lot of people think that async IO is pretty complex, and of course they are right, but um, one problem uh, with async IO, with current async IO, is that we, we explain it wrong. Uh, and how we should explain async IO is that it basically has two levels. One is normal. 
high level uh, um, of async I.O. And it includes functions like run, gather, create tasks, sleep, streams API, subprocesses API, logs, all those primitives that you can use from async await. And then it has a hardcore layer. That's basically for uh, people who write frameworks, who write uh, libraries, low level details, uh, interface with C code. And that's pretty much all of the internals of async IO, protocols, transports, all methods on event loop, and even event loop itself. Um, async IO futures, basically you don't really need to know about them to program with <coughs> modern async IO. If you, if you are creating an uh, AI HTTP application, let's say, you really don't need to bother with the event loop. You just use async await. And, uh, at, this, at this point of time, your application will kind of look like a tree or query application. Uh, because you don't, you just, you just don't use those low-level APIs. So quickly about async I run. This was the popular pattern to uh, run an async I/O application. You basically had some coroutine, you import async I/O, and then you you had you had to do this weird dance. You had to get the current or create a new event loop with the get event loop function. You had to run. You, you wanted to run this coroutine with this run until complete method, and then you closed the event loop. The problem with this code. Uh, isn't just that it's long and it's hard to type, it's that it's also incorrect because when you, uh, when you type loop close, it doesn't really close uh, or cancel uh, currently active asynchronous tasks, background asynchronous tasks. And if you have asynchronous generators in your code, those won't uh, be canceled as well, as well. And that's pretty important because those asynchronous generators, they might have like a lot of logic in them uh, they might have a try final statement. You actually want this code to run, uh, but if you just close the loop, nothing will will, will happen. So starting with Python 3.7, that's how that's how you would run your program, and that's that's the recommended way to, to run an async I/O program. You just use the async I/O run function, and async I/O run isn't isn't uh, isn't isn't a simple function. That that's basically some. Uh, that, that's basically the source code of async around without some extra checks and comments. You, you, you don't need to read it. It's only here to, to kind of show that a lot of stuff is actually happening in, in async around and it's really hard to get all the details right to write this function. So just use it. Um, ideally, your async await program should have just one coroutine in which uh, you initialize your program uh, and you run that coroutine with async I run. Just don't, don't use those loop uh, loop uh, run until complete and run forever method. There is, they are no longer necessary, basically. And try to use async await for everything. You, you, sh you, sh you shouldn't really try to use the low level APIs. I cannot really stress this, this point enough. At, 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 at this point of time, you really don't need to know about futures and, uh, and callbacks. Just use async await. Don't pass a reference to the currently running event loop to any kind of libraries. They will be able to get it reliably without your help. So when we were working on async IO run function, uh, there was another pattern in async IO, and that's basically around the run forever function and servers. So when you create a server, you want you kind of want to create it and accept <laughs> incoming connections, and you want event loop to just run it forever, just to execute it. Uh, and this is this is an example, an actual example from Python documentation how you would run it, and you see a lot of low-level code, and it's, it's really hard to, to get a sense of what what this code is doing. So in Python 3.7, we added a few a uh, few more APIs to server. Uh, now servers um, are asynchronous context managers. So when 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 they exit the context, they are properly closed, uh, and we also have the serve forever method. Which you can which you can just use inside that statement, and you can use async I run. So what we have here is essentially the same code, equivalent code, but it's uh, twice uh, as short, and it's, it's it's actually more correct. And then we have this function, and um, it's it's kind of low level. It's kinda, it it kind of goes against what I was I was saying that you shouldn't care about event loop. There are some some. Um, uh, so sometimes you have to care about it. Only because 
we don't have async await versions of all APIs yet. In Python 3.8, we'll try to fix that. So for instance, if you want to listen uh, for an OS signal, you have to use this add signal handler function on, on the event loop. So if you have a code like this, you should basically rewrite it to, to use async I run and you use this new get running loop function that is allowed to be used only from async await. And just a couple of don'ts. Uh, don't use the coroutine decorator, don't use the yield from. We'll, uh, we'll just deprecate it in Python 3.8 and remove it in 3.8 or 3.9 or maybe, maybe Python 4. Uh, we'll just remove this 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 whole uh, legacy thing forever, and don't use again. Don't use low level APIs. You don't you don't really need them. So uh, now let's talk about good async await code and, and what code is good. Uh, maybe the one that you can write uh, quickly or uh, maintainable code or beautiful or robust and fast. Many of those things are subjective, and some of those things are highly subjective. Uh, but the last two, robust and fast, those you can actually measure and, and how you measure them. Uh, the only way to, to, uh, to measure them correctly is to, is to do monitoring in production. And uh, the, the sad thing here is that it wasn't really possible to, to monitor correctly async IO code in Python uh, 3.6 and prior. In Python 3.7, we have now context variables and now try to explain you why, uh, why it was such a big problem before. So uh, in order to understand why we needed context variables in Python 3.7, here is how event loop uh, sees your program. For an event loop, it's just basically a sequence of callbacks. And once it, uh, it is done with the current sequence of callbacks, there is another sequence of callbacks, another and another one. So all, event, all that event loop, uh, knows about is, is basically those callbacks completely uh, completely not connected with each other, whereas in reality, usually, you have some structure in your program. Those callbacks might be uh, all related to some asynchronous task or something like that. So uh, in Python 37, we decided to address this problem. We decided that we need this structure in our uh, async program to at least monitor them, to at least profile them reliably. So uh, I started to work on context virus, and there are a couple of PEPs that you might be interested in. That's PEP 550, that's how it all started. Uh, besides just fixing the, um, uh, the async IO or async await problem, it also tried to address this problem, problem for uh, generators, and it was too complex. So we created a spin of PEP, PEP 567, a slightly different API, but simpler design. There are around 900 emails on Python ideas and Python dev because suddenly everybody had an opinion about context variables. And uh, async await it was really a tough battle, but uh, we finally got it in. So first of all, it's magic. And like with any magic, you shouldn't just use it because you want to. Because sometimes a global variable is good enough or you can just use uh, a keyword argument to your function and pass things explicitly. But uh, there are some, thing, uh, so, some um, areas where you cannot really do that. Uh, they're shipped with Python 3.7, part of standard library. Uh, Async.io supports them out of the box, and I think Trio supports them now out of the box as well. The decimal module uh, uses it, so uh, that was actually a bug, I think, before, because in Python 3.6 and, and, and earlier, if you do some decimal calculations in two different asynchronous tasks run, run in parallel and you have different decimal contexts, all those decimal contexts would, would, would be mixed up and you would get a wrong calculation. So in Python 3.7, we fixed it. So uh, because context variables aren't really a uh, syntax extension, uh, you have to work with them programmatically. So you import the context uh, virus module, you create, you declare a uh, context variable programmatically. You just uh, create an object with a name. You use the set function to assign a value uh, to a context var uh, variable and you use the get method to look up the value, the current value for this context variable. So if we get back to async IO and how, and how event loop sees your, uh, your program and, you, and the structure of it, uh, if you actually create a context variable and just assign some random random number to it in, in, in every top level asynchronous task in your application, you will see a picture like this. So basically you will be able to trace the, the uh, to trace that number, to trace the origin of this callback throughout your, uh, throughout the execution. 
So you can use context variables for monitoring, obviously, for profiling, for tracing. You can use it for localization. For instance, you, uh, if you know that the current user is an uh, English or uh, German speaking, uh, speaking um, a guy, you can just put that language to a context variable and you will always know that. You can use it for security, you can put the current user ID or current uh, security capabilities into the context variable and you will be able to read, read those from basically any point in your application. You can use it obviously for debug, you can just create a temporary context variable, put something into it and see if, if it reads uh, in some callback or some asynchronous function. Uh, basically to check if the things are connected, something like that. And you can use it to store execution context, uh, for, for instance, decimal context or NumPy error context will, will use context variables to work correctly in, in, in async await. But the big question is what we have in mind for async IO in Python 3.8 and maybe Python 3.9 and here I think it's a good time to start to talk about Trio. So Trio was created by Nathaniel Smith. Uh, around Python 3.6, and it's also designed from scratch. It's incompatible with async IO. It has completely different design under the hood. Uh, I think there is some interop layer. I'm not sure how well it works uh, right now. And Trio has a very hard focus on usability and readability of the code. So basically, Nathaniel is obsessed uh, with allowing you to control your code with the highest precision possible. And Trio, I think, got many things right. And there is a YouTube talk of Nathaniel explaining Trio and why he created Trio at PyCon US a few months ago. And if you haven't seen that talk, uh, please do it. It's, it's an amazing talk. And actually, I used a couple of slides with Nathaniel permissions um, from his talk. So this is how programs looked like in, in, in 1958. So basically, you have a line number and you have a sequence uh, uh, of, uh, of codes or commands, and you could, you could actually jump from one line to another. And if you visualize all those jumps in your program, you basically, uh, you basically see something like this. So it was completely untraceable, and then you, you wouldn't be actually able to, to tell what this program is doing um, just by, by, by glancing at it. And 10 years later, uh, Dijkstra um, wrote uh, a letter which was titled Go to Statement Consider It Harmful and, and uh, came up with this idea of structured programming. And the idea of structured programming and that is that you have some primitives uh, that you can use to build your programs with. You, you can have an if block, you can have a loop, uh, you can have loops, uh, you can have function calls and the idea is that uh, there is only one entrance point and there is only one exit point in your logic. So the code is always predictable. There is no go to, there is no this random jumps in the program. And if you really think about go to and you think about asynchronous programming, you will see a lot of parallels. If you, if you use in async IO, if you use create task function, it will create a task and it will run in parallel and you have no control over that task. If, if it fails with an exception, nothing will happen for you. You will probably see it in the logs, but uh, you cannot really react to that, to that uh, exception. So back to Trio. Uh, in Trio, Nathaniel added this, this concept of a nursery. And nursery is the only way to, to spawn some asynchronous task in, 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 in Trio. Uh, it's, 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 it's a funny name, I think, because tasks are born uh, in, in nursery, they die in nursery. Basically, it's not possible to graduate from nursery. Uh, yeah, it's a dark place, uh, but that's, but, but that's, but, but that's the point. That's kind of the whole point of nurseries is that uh, once you, once you go through this asynchronous with block, you are sure that all your tasks are done. If one of them fails, the other tasks will be canceled and the exception will be propagated correctly. So you can surround this, uh, this async with statement with the try accept block and you will get your logic back. So there is no go to here. There is some out of order execution because those uh, two uh, coroutines will, will run in parallel in this example. But uh, at the end of the async with block, they, they, they both will be done and that, that's a guarantee. So uh, in Trio, there is almost no out-of-order execution, and you can always trace the control flow. Exceptions are never lost, so uh, it's, it's up to you if you want to ignore the exception. But by, by default, uh, you, you have to handle them. Uh, with, and therefore, with and try blocks always work. And uh, I think that this, this approach kind of solved this, this, this go-to problem in concurrency. Your program become 
uh, becomes traceable. So if we go back to, to async IO and this whole mess of callbacks and allocated resources and an event loop and imagine how an HTTP client library might, 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 might look like. So it probably has some HTTP client object which spawns those callbacks and those callbacks spawn another callback. Uh, and you maybe have a transport or some other resource allocated by your HTTP cli uh, client. And then something happens, an exceptional error. So what will happen? And the, the, the current answer to that is undefined. Like we don't know what, to have, what will happen. If you have a callback written like this, so you have a try accept statement in it, uh, then you can actually handle, uh, handle any exception in your callback, but you have to be explicit about it, you have to care about it. And most libraries actually don't. They kind of think that everything will go just fine and uh, exceptions basically don't exist. Uh, some invent some, uh, some mechanism to propagate those, those exceptions back uh, to the client, but even in, in AHTP and async PG, I'm pretty sure there are lots of bugs where we didn't really handle those exceptions correctly. So it's essentially a bug magnet in async, in async and it's a constant point of pain because you have to care about those callbacks all the time. So what we actually need, we, we need uh, a way to handle those exceptions and callbacks or any other resources that event loop allocated us. So if something happens, if the, the async IO event loop, async IO itself should help us to close, uh, to close those and deallocate those resources. So I have an idea for Python 3.8 and this is just an idea. Uh, I discussed it briefly with a few core developers and I think we'll have something like that in, in, uh, in async IO 3.8 and that's a low level API. It's called create supervisor. And create supervisor returns you an asynchronous context, uh, context manager, context object. You can use it in, in the async with statement. And supervisor kind of mirrors all async I event loop APIs. So it, it will have the call soon method, it will have call later method, create connection, create server. Uh, so the idea is that we can kind of give a virtual event loop to any, to any library that wants to, use the, uh, that wants to use the event loop and we can track all those resources and you can pass it around if you want just like you would an event loop. And this is a low level API, so it's meant to be used for in, in libraries like AIHTTP or uh, AsyncPG. Uh, and this is an example of such a hypothetical uh, HTTP library where you have a get method. So you get, a, you, get, you, you get a reference to the currently running event loop, then you create a supervisor and you can work with the supervisor just the way you would uh, with a normal uh, async I event loop. Uh, but what we have here is that because the supervisor will be unique to that point uh, uh, in your library, we, we know all the resources that will allocate, so any unhandled exception will first propagate uh, correctly, and then we'll be able to clean up all those resources. Um, and uh, there is another Similar idea, and again, thanks to Curio, is to add async IO task group in Python 3.8. Uh, that's basically an alternative to async IO gather, which is, I think, very badly designed. There are lots of hysterical reasons why gather uh, works like it, like, like it does. But this thing would be, would be way more convenient and way more flexible. Uh, and this actually looks pretty similar to Trio and Curio, and it's, it's a very high-level uh, high code. So task group will likely just use the, uh, the create supervisor uh, under the hood uh, and will behave pretty, pretty similar to how Trio nurseries uh, are working. It's more convenient than Gather. Gather has some very strange default, uh, um, default config options. So for instance, by default, if you run five things, five different asynchronous tasks with Gather and one of them fail, fails, it will just propagate the exception and the, the rest of them will continue the execution and those exceptions or results, they will be just lost. And a lot of people just don't know about that, but it's pretty dangerous. You have to, you have to be careful when you use async or gather. And you can do more magic with uh, task groups, like if you have a million tasks to execute, it would be unwise to, to push them all at once. You probably want to bucket them and execute them uh, in, in, in portions. So what else? Uh, can we expect from Python 3.8? Well, first of all, we hear you, even if you don't write your, don't submit your bugs and feature requests to bugspython.org, even if you are just crying and Reddit or Twitter, 
uh, or hacker news. We, we usually try to, 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 uh, to find out those pain points that people have. Um, but please do submit your uh, bugs and feature requests to bugspython.org because we are really, really uh, listening. A lot of people have this this idea that the async IO core developers don't really care about what, what people say or want. That, that's, that's not true. Uh, the documentation has to be improved. About uh, two years ago, I was standing uh, at EuroPython and promised that we'll update the documentation. And I'm excited to announce that nothing has changed. Uh, it's, it still sucks. Uh, uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll try to improve it as, as, as soon as possible. Likely, we'll have uh, create supervisor and task groups in, in Python 3.8. They might have different names, or maybe we'll change some API details. Uh, but uh, it's, 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 it's very likely that we'll have something like that. I'm also working to add low-level uh, tracing API. I, I'll, I'll be doing that in UV loop first to kind of prototype and let people play with it. The idea is that there are some services like Zipkin or New Relic, and they allow you to, to look uh, deeply in your code and, and, and figure out how it works and what, what, what is happening with it. So we actually want to know, uh, for instance, uh, all tail latencies or all, all timings or how many bytes uh, are pushed through some protocol or transports. And currently, there is absolutely no way to do that in async I, without patching the core. So we want this, we want this tracing API to be flexible and, and usable for, uh, for, for people. Uh, maybe we'll implement timeout and cancel scopes, just like Trio. And that's, that's also a pretty unique feature in Trio, because in Trio, you don't really care about timeouts at all. You don't care about them when you write uh, third-party libraries when you write HTTP, let's say HTTP client, you don't really care about timeouts. Trio ca kind of uh, does all this work to handle them and to implement them in the core. So you just write your code, and if you want a timeout, you just use a context manager around that, that call site, uh, and the timeout logic will, will, will be applied correctly, and uh, all allocated things will be cleaned up and and managed for you. And the same idea, and I actually recommend you to read some of Nathaniel's blog posts. Those are pretty, uh, you, you can Google them easily. Uh, those are also interesting ideas about cancel scopes and how he does cancellations. So a lot of those ideas, they can be applied to async IO in one way or another. And we are now thinking about how we can, how, 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 how we can have them in async IO. The other, another idea that I have is to improve the streams API and basically not just improve it but to substitute, substitute it with something sane because right now when you use streams you have this reader and writer object with different methods and for instance you want to close your stream which, which close method you should call should you call it on the reader or on the writer or maybe you should call two close methods uh, so it's really hard for people to grasp how streams work, and I think that's part of the reason, uh, one, one of the reasons why um, people don't really use those streams. So I have an idea to design new API for AsyncIO with two top-level functions, AsyncIO Connect and AsyncIO Surf, uh, and have a single streams object uh, working for them. Maybe we'll add a context manager for the shield function, and shield function allows you to shield some code or some coroutine from from cancellation, and uh, right now the only way uh, in async is to use this function, but then you have to always refactor your code. You have to move your finally block into a function and then use it with the shield. So it's, 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 really, it's really painful. We're also rewriting the SSL implementation in async IO from scratch. Uh, again, I'm, I'm doing this work in UV loop to kind of uh, try this, uh, this rewrite uh, in the wild. Uh, but it will handle a lot of a lot of different bugs and a lot of uh, different a lot of inconsistencies that we now have in, the, in our SSL implementation in async IO, like doing the cancellation correctly and doing uh, things like SSL over SSL. And there is another uh, uh, thing that that really worries me uh, is that the cancel there in async IO. Uh, it's, uh, it's derived from exception and not from base exception. So when people put try accept exception in their code base, and that's a pretty popular uh, way to catch all exceptions, they kind of break the async IO cancellation completely and entirely. So we are thinking about uh, uh, fixing this, uh, but this is a backwards incompatible change. So um, I have no idea if we, if we actually push this through. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Thank you very much. Uh,
So we have pretty much time for Q&A. <coughs> Please raise your hand or you can go here. Okay, there's not so much people to... Okay, please. Hey, so I'm pretty much satisfied with the gather, although I, I've been t tweaking its options a bit. For example, I, I can have like a list of stuff that... Return exceptions. Yeah, the result, results and exceptions. So how is uh, Trio's nursery, for example, better than just using gather uh, with some more information about it? Yeah, so uh, th that's a very good question, actually, uh, be because that's a fundamental problem uh, right now in Python. In Python, you uh, usually have some synchronous code and you can write only one exception. And in, in things like Trio, Async, or Curio, you can have your uh, task group and it will execute many different things in parallel. So you can have many different exceptions coming from one point. Uh, and the idea is to create some sort of multi-error, a thing that can uh, can uh, envelop a few uh, few few exceptions in it. Uh, so we'll likely add a mechanism, a built-in Python mechanism, uh, to uh, to be able to create those kind of multi-errors and uh, in in Python code. So uh, you will get and, and that multi-error, you will be able to catch it, and then you will have to use some API to kind of go through those exceptions uh, and and make sense of them. And the other thing is that Gather uses some magic under the hood, but if, if you just pass coroutines to, to Gather, it will wrap them uh, implicitly with tasks, and you won't have references to those tasks in your code. With async, um, uh, with async task groups, you will do that explicitly, so you will have a reference to a task. So you will be able to collect your uh, results of the computation explicitly if you want after the uh, async with uh, block. Uh, so yeah, that's that, that's that's that, that's the idea. The main challenge will be to add the multi-error and have a nice uh, UI attached to it. Okay, thanks. Uh, can I have w w one more follow-up? Uh, actually, if you do gather do context variables from three seven go to those spawn. They do. They do. Great, thanks. So, any more questions? Okay, um, please don't forget to rate this session. Just go to conference app and do it. Please, don't leave this talk in nursery. Uh, thank you. Um, so I've been using uh, Python uh, since Python 3.3 and some uh, older stuff, but um, um, I was wondering like, it seems like a lot of broken things were actually introduced in the older versions while I was kind of thinking, you know, everything is stable about AsyncIO. Um, can we expect uh, more broken stuff or are we reaching some kind of stability then? Or are these just minor things in the end? Yeah, we don't, we don't want to break anything in AsyncIO or in Python. <laughs> uh, we'll try to be, uh, to be very careful about that. Uh, I also don't expect AsyncIO to completely stabilize and freeze. We actually want to add those new APIs. We want to keep improving it. Unfortunately, we, we, we cannot really improve it with the, uh, as, as fast as we want because it's tied to Python release cycle. Uh, but I think that AsyncIO will be pretty different than, uh, in Python 4.2 or 4.3. Uh, but backwards compatible, of course. All right. Uh, another one uh, question then. So if you introduce shield, do you then also have to introduce destroy shield, or is that not going to be an <laughs> endless uh, battle? Yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe we'll add levels, so you can't really destroy a 80 level um, shield or something like that. Uh, really okay. have no idea about that, but I, 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 I kind of think that, uh, that that isn't really necessary. If you shield something, then it's just important that you should always let it. Uh, let it finish, and if you have some hard timeout, well, then just kill the Schneider program. Uh, it will probably clean up just fine. Thank you. Any more? Okay. Who's first? Um, I'm just wondering, what do you think is the future of UV loop? Like, is is it still more performant than the standard async IO loop and that's the main reason to keep using it? Will it ever be part of the standard library? 
it, it, it can be part of uh, standard library, library the way it is right now because it uses Cython and Cython is a huge dependency. Uh, and also it uses LibUV and LibUV is, is also a very complicated dependency. Uh, to include something like UV loop right in async IO will have to uh, write a lot of C code and that's basically hundreds of thousands of lines of code. Uh, so probably it's not going to happen anytime soon so it will just happily live as a separate PyPI module uh, for a long time to come. And by the way, uh, also check out another third party event loop implementation. It's called Tokyo by Nikolai Kim, the original creator of AIHTTP and it's written in Rust. And the whole point is that you can use Tokyo to as kind of a single, single bridge between Python asynchronous uh, world and Rust asynchronous frameworks. Uh, so it's pretty interesting and I think uh, it's pretty stable right now so you can use that as well. Hi there, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, so one of the things I was sort of confused about <coughs> with the context bars is if you start doing things like you uh, ensure future on a coroutine and then sort of pass it around, which context does that uh, coroutine get? It always inherits the context of where it was called, the where ensure future, created. where the task is created. Basically, when task is created, it captures the current context. And, and, and keeps it forever. Okay, thanks. Uh, hi. Uh, do you think that uh, you can you could add uh, the concept of uh, tasks having names to AsyncIO? Because threads have names, uh, trios tasks have names, but AsyncIO has no way to add names to tasks. It's very useful when you are debugging stuff. And for example, PyCharms, PyCharm has a tool that allows you to view all those separate tasks, but if they don't have names, uh, it gets a lot harder. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. So it can be a very good first contribution to, to Python, so go ahead. <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK, uh, another question. Um, uh, trios nurseries, uh, the, the really trios uh, spawn tasks uh, don't have any way of you know uh, getting their results. How do you feel about that? Getting results. Of what? Yeah, because when you spawn a task in trio, uh, you don't really get a task object that you can just wait on. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have to use other primitives to get the results. Yeah. So async I has a lot of history, and uh, we cannot just adopt that trio pattern. And again. Nathaniel is, is very obsessed with uh, providing just one way of launching tasks, and that's on purpose. That's why Trio programs has some, some qualities that async IO programs probably never will. Uh, but I think that uh, the current async IO way of doing things, they, they, getting the task object is flexible enough, and uh, people will do just fine if we give them enough primitives like task groups to work with them in a coherent way. Okay, thanks. We have time for one more short question. Hi, uh, is there a difference between context variables and dynamic variables in Lisp? Um, so back then when we had those 900 emails, uh, on Python ideas and Python dev, I, I, I knew the answer and I, I was able to articulate it uh, 20 or 30 times, but now I don't remember the, like, like all the differences between dynamic scoping and, and context variables. Uh, one, one particular difference is that context is basically an immutable mapping in memory, so once you capture it, it loses the, uh, this link with the old context where it, where it came from, so you, it won't see updates in the original parent context. Uh, so this is probably the key difference. But there are some other differences. And unfortunately, I don't remember them all right now. Thanks. Thanks so much.